Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Zoe, for those of you who haven't met me, and I am the project and product manager here at the Rebus community. Uh, so these office hour sessions we run monthly uh, with the Open Textbook Network. Uh, and for us, they're really a chance to engage with the community who are out there doing work on open textbooks in all sorts of ways. Uh, for our part, we're developing a model of publishing open textbooks, and we know that that has all sorts of implications. And really, these, this is a chance for us to get together, to talk through these things, work out what areas of uh, challenges there are, and, and how we might come to uh, some solutions together as a community, and build those into to processes going forward. So we all move forward together with, with some really strong uh, publishing uh, models, <laughs> I think about that sums up why, why we like to be here. So we're joined by some wonderful guests. Uh, but first, I will hand over to Karen from OTN uh, to speak a little bit about their work too and get us underway. Thank you, Zoe. Um, I am Karen Lauritsen. I'm Managing Director with the Open Textbook Network and am delighted to co-host monthly office hours with Hugh, Zoe, Liz, Aperva, everyone at the Rebus Foundation. Um, just as a friendly reminder, you can watch previous office hours on YouTube, and I'll put the short link in the chat. I'm also going to put a link in the chat for a quick form if there are particular topics that you would like to revisit or explore in future office hour sessions. Please let us know, either in the chat today or through this form at another time. Um, so the Open Textbook Network is a community across the United States and growing internationally. We have more than 75 members representing more than 600 institutions, which is roughly 15% of higher education. And we share best practices, support, and professional development for moving open education forward. Uh, recently, in another collaboration with the Rebus community and also Creative Commons USA, we created an adaptable OER publishing agreement, and I will put that link also in the chat. Uh, it's a starting point for higher education institutions that want to contract with their faculty to make OER, and we designed it in such a way that institutions can meet their own local um, pro intellectual property policy requirements. So that's something else that we work together on that we're happy to finally be able to share with you. But today, we are here to talk about beta testing open textbooks, and we are delighted to welcome four guests. Um, the first we will hear from is Michael Laffey. He's Assistant Professor of Classics at Washington and Lee University. I'll turn things over to him shortly, but first I'll introduce just our three other guests. We'll second hear from Diana Fisher. She's Director of Open Oregon State. And also Linda Brusland, who's a senior instructor too and lead advisor with the microbiology department at Open Oregon State. And finally, we will hear from Elizabeth Mays from Rebus and Arizona State University, who's also been working on a project that involves beta testing. So um, as all of our guests and perhaps you out there know, beta testing with students and faculty can be a competitive advantage of open textbooks. And today we're going to explore the logistics of how exactly you do that. Is the process different depending on whether you're testing the author or a colleague's book in your classroom? When and how can OER publishers market a new work to benefit from beta testers? What are the best mechanisms for collecting and integrating feedback? And how do you decide which suggestions should be implemented and when? So with all of those questions top of mind, I turn it over to Michael. Thank you. So I'm Michael Laffey, and um, the book that I have been working on with a co-author, um, an open textbook, is on ancient Greek. And so what we wanted to do is create a new way to teach ancient Greek that, uh, would, that would also um, uh, be able to be taken by other professors and be edited by other professors so that it could sort of accord with their academic calendars and with their pedag um, pedagogical um, preferences and also just sort of have a new approach to ancient Greek in general. And so uh, I've been writing this um, with my co-author for several years now. And initially, we, as we developed our lessons, we had them all trapped on these PDFs that we would show our students and we'd give them little lessons. And then this year, and part of last year, we started converting all these lessons into press books. And the idea now is that um, all the lessons would be um, not only online on a website, but also um, exportable as an ebook or even as a print on demand um, PDF. So this year, 
we've been beta testing it on three campuses. So there's my campus here, Louisiana State University, and the University of Illinois. So we've got three professors going at their own pace, um, working through these things. Um, but it's actually last year, um, as I was developing these lessons, that I was doing a lot of beta testing in general with my students. And what was great about using Pressbooks is that as students were offering suggestions, I would actually on the computer edit the text um, sort of accordingly. Some of this was to fix typos, and some of this was also to um, better answer the questions that they may have had in their head that I didn't have uh, previously while I was composing it. So anyway, um, as regards beta testing, um, what I can speak to most is how I've incorporated it into the classroom, um, how I've incorporated student feedback, and then in the future, how we're going to be incorporating um, faculty feedback as we move forward. Michael, do you want to say just a couple more things then about how you've um, incorporated into the classroom? Yeah, well, first of all, we just teach with it. So there you go, right? You're already <laughs> in the water. And so it was yesterday, actually. Was it yesterday? It was yesterday where somebody noticed that instead of the future tense, I had the present tense. So right there, live, right? But a lot of it is going to be, um, as I give a lesson, um, judging the students' uh, reactions to that lesson has actually made me edit it for the next time that I teach it um, quite a bit, actually. And so in a lot of ways, the students are um, sort of co-editors of this book as we go forward, because all of us professors are geniuses who know the best. And then it actually hits the world, and then you realize maybe that was an infelicitous uh, way to uh, put that paragraph. And so that's been a lot of the um, feedback loop, and it's been constant and developing. And it has really shaped um, the book. So even when I had these just on slides, I was incorporating a lot of their feedback. And so um, anyway, what's been nice about having um, this thing on press books, like I said, is I can edit live while um, I'm actually talking to them. But with ancient Greek, what you're talking about is, um, you know, you have your paradigms, you have to memorize this and your vocabulary. And so some of it is, um, uh, a little bit easier to edit maybe than if I were writing a textbook that had mainly prose lessons in it, right? I mean, that might be a sort of different animal um, in terms of feedback. The other thing that I've done is the two other uh, professors who are teaching with this um, have editing rights on the book. And so what they could also do is if they see something um, they can just go in and edit as well. One of the challenges there, however, um, that we've been talking uh, about with ourselves is what if somebody edits something in a past chapter that you've already covered, and then students go back to review for an exam? There'll be some alarming surprises there. Uh, so far that hasn't happened, but it's been something that we've been trying to think about uh, more often as we're going forward. And there's other things. It's not just, um, does that make sense? Also pace. You, um, there have been some examples in which something that takes two chapters, um, I'll divide into three chapters based upon uh, the feedback that I'm getting from students. So, you know, how much material are we actually able to cover in class? So sometimes you think, you know, I'll definitely be able to get through this and this and this. And with Greek students, what's interesting is if you have mainly Latin students who've had Latin previously, that course goes a lot faster than if you have students, a body of students, a cohort who hasn't had much Latin. So even those kinds of things have sort of influenced um, even the way that you're dividing up the material, even if the material that you've composed uh, has been reasonably sound. Thank you. Okay, so um, I will hand things over to Diana now, who will talk about her experience. And then once we've heard from Diana, Linda, and Liz, we will open it up to um, questions from the community. So Diana, over to you. Okay, thanks. Uh, this is Diana Fisher. I'm the director of Open Oregon State at Oregon State University. And I'm just going to kind of cover a little bit more of a high level because I want Linda to be able to get into actual details about her book. So I'm going to talk about a couple other projects uh, and how we worked with them and how we did them. So one of the things that I always ask faculty when they're getting ready to start these projects um, is whether they're adopting something, adapting something, or authoring, is to pay attention um, to where students historically, as they've been teaching this class, um, have had issues understanding um, the subject matter, or maybe it might just be some little element of it. And let's start there when we think about really where we want to concentrate efforts on, on testing things out with them. Because yes, we do want to test out the um, 
the work as a whole. But if we know that students are having issues with maybe understanding how a cell divides and traditionally other textbooks haven't covered that in a way that um, has met the student needs or really has met faculty needs and they've got to go over it again. Let's start creating those kinds of things right there. And then that's where we've been starting with our, our beta testing on big projects. Um, uh, covering the things that we know are going to be needed and then going back and forth on those. Um, and I, I hope that Linda is going to be able to cover kind of the online versus on campus because she's had the experience with both. Um, but uh, we've also kept a let's edit this um, currently version and then an also in use version. So we can go back and forth on those and either copy paste and and we've been so careful we've actually kept these on different servers. Um, just so we know that we can always go back or we can always restore a complete version. Um, right there. So a couple of the the projects that we've got going right now that that fit this um, are we've got a book that an author uh, had previously had published through a publisher and the book went out of print and the publisher asked to have a, um, a new version um, done and the author said no I'd really rather have my copyright back to be able to offer this uh, freely to students and so he did get his copyright back and he handed all the files over to us and we had the very first thing we did with that was beta test with grad students because the grad students know the material this was a grad level book so we had his um, his advanced students so the doctoral students went through the book um, and looked at all the things that they thought might need update what they thought wasn't um, wasn't good what they thought could be redone um, and we've done all of that editing and the grad students now the the doctoral students are now going to take this book down to a master's level course and beta test that with the master's students um, what he also hopes to do is get some of his advanced undergraduate students to give some feedback too. And what he's going to use on this version of it with the advanced undergraduate students are what kind of materials will you need to know before you can uh, digest what's in this book. So we're hoping to be able to build on that whole beta testing process to create maybe two more versions or to, um, to lead in versions of the book. Um, so that's a couple of things that we're doing on the beta testing process. Um, Linda, who will speak with us in just a second, she has gone through the process um, of beta testing with her, um, her book that she wrote, the microbiology book that she did right from the beginning. All right, Diana, you great. You want me to talk about Go the, for it. the process? <laughs> okay, so this is general microbiology. It's a 300 level course. Um, and I did just start kind of from scratch as far as writing the textbook. But I, I mean, I've taught this class for 10 years. Um, and I just found that students weren't using the textbook from the publisher so I wanted something that was available to all the students. I wanted something that was actually simplified that didn't cover the topics in such depth you know that they were chapters they could read very easily they had no excuse uh, for not coming to class and having read the chapters um, and I did the first time I used it was last year with my summer class so that was an on-campus course and what I found is that it allowed me to give uh, group activities during the class time where the students could actually, they either came with printed out copies, uh, pages of the appropriate chapters, or they were accessing them on their phone or the computer, um, you know, and that way they could utilize that information while they were doing these group activities. And then I also started using it for my eCampus class um, as well. Linda, can you talk a little bit about um, if there are differences between your live and online experience briefly? Um, um, well, in terms of the, do you mean in terms of the way the course is set up or as far as how the textbook is utilized? 
Yeah, I guess in terms of beta testing the textbook, if there were differences in, in running your summer in-person class versus your online session. Um, I mean, I think the main difference was that summer class, which happened to be an uh, on-campus class or a live class, was the first time I had ever used the textbook. So mm -hmm. certainly I invited students to provide me with feedback to catch those, you know, spelling errors or grammatical errors to also tell me about things that there, there wasn't enough information on or things that were worded confu you know, confusingly, you know, ways that I could improve. And I invited them to give me that feedback. I basically said, this is the first time ever I'm using this textbook, so tell me how I can make it better. And they did. You know, they, I think they took that very seriously. And that has continued to a point with the eCampus courses. I mean, I've now taught it, I think, four times since then, you know, through eCampus. And I will still get students that will say, hey, you know, this is misspelled or this doesn't make sense. So um, at this point, I contact Diana and it gets fixed within minutes, which is wonderful. <laughs> um, but that was probably the, the biggest difference. There were, you know, as far as the first time using it and figuring out how this would go. Um, I will say that this went along with other revisions to my courses in general, both live and uh, eCampus, but I do pre-post assessment, you know, on basic topics, and I have done for 10 years, and I can tell you that the post-assessment scores went up dramatically um, after using this. After And part of it could be part of the other changes I've made to the course. It's hard to parse that out, but uh, it was very gratifying to see that. Very exciting. Thank you. So now I would like to turn things over to Liz so we can hear about her experience. Fantastic. Um, so most of you know me from Rebus, but I am also an adjunct faculty at Arizona State University in the journalism school. And one of the courses I had taught previously was business and future of journalism. And when I took it over, they wanted me to make it more like an entrepreneurial journalism course, which is being taught in a lot of different universities right now. And I had a lot of trouble finding something that would be appropriate as a textbook for that course for that exact audience. And I knew that some of the other professors for other sections and at other institutions were having the same issue. So I kind of, you know, jokingly pitched, you know, why don't we all get together and write a textbook? And then I noticed about a month later, a colleague of mine at a different institution, Michelle Ferrier at Univers Ohio University, she posted on Facebook, I'm going to get, you know, all of my colleagues together, let's write it, let's write a textbook for this class. And I was like, whoa, and, and her class is slightly different, um, but that's how media innovation and entrepreneurship was born. And it was born to serve the business and future media innovation and journalism entrepreneurship courses, which are all slightly different, um, as well as it was built in a modular way so that pieces of it could be used in different courses that touch on entrepreneurial journalism. So I wanted to talk about sort of how we marketed the book to beta testers and also the process of absorbing that feedback and integrating it into the book. Um, in terms of marketing it, we got very lucky and Michelle had an amazing network who is teaching this across the country and within a few emails, we actually had a dozen people officially signed up to beta test it um, just from her network that she knew. Uh, we also extended that further. We opened up a bi-weekly call uh, for a broader community who were using parts of the book, um, including some of the authors and who were giving us uh, feedback from their experience as well as their reading of the book every few weeks as well. Um, the process of actually taking all that feedback got pretty convoluted and we ended up we ended up basically saying, we'll take your feedback however you want to give it. So give us feedback. Um, we enabled the hypothesis on the book. So we had students commenting on the book, reacting to the book, reflecting, um, giving things that confuse them. And we took each of those items, put them into a spreadsheet. Um, we also had faculty official beta testers sending us sort of narrative reflections from their students and themselves on things that could be improved in two chapters every two weeks. Uh, and then on top of that, we also had these biweekly calls at which people who were using different pieces of the book, about another dozen people convened and also gave feedback on what could be added to the book, changed, what was confusing, um, what they didn't like about it or things that they really did like. Um, so we took each of those items of feedback and put them into a Google spreadsheet as a line item and there ended up being somewhat 200 or so. And we even had a couple other mechanisms for feedback. So some people were, were like, you know, we had a Google form but that wasn't quite right for the needs of some people. They wanted to like actually help copy edit a chapter further. So we would send them the chapters and as your feedback, we'll put it into the book. Um, and I guess what I wanted to stress is that 
that that process is is kind of an imperfect one. I'd love to hear what other people have come to for solutions of tracking and uh, and integrating all of this. It's very laborious, and I loved it. Like I love that process of working with people and having a two way conversation, um, and and being able to absorb that feedback. But it's definitely like a a very resource intense kind of activity. Um, and then every few weeks, my collaborator, Michelle and I, we would go over all of the feedback and decide if um, if we should implement it, how we should implement it, who should implement it, and when we should implement it. You know, some changes were a little too big for the first edition. Others were like, we can do this instantly. You know, others we had to send back to the authors, um, et cetera. And I guess the last thing I would say is that I really wish there was a better mechanism what I really wish was a magic mechanism for in taking a piece of feedback like on the book itself and then responding to that piece of feedback on the piece itself to say, yes, we did this or no, we actually can't do this, but you can adapt the book yourself and do it on your version or we're going to do this, but it's going to take us a month or something like that. And that I haven't quite figured out just with balancing integrating all the changes to get it out the door for the official release how to actually talk, you know, have a longer conversation with all of those who, who gave us feedback and also how to translate that feedback to the authors themselves. So some things might need a translation before going back to the author and that also is a time consuming thing I haven't been able to approach yet. All right, thanks Liz. And thank you for your questions of your fellow guests and anyone else who may be in on the call. Maybe that's a great place to start in terms of tracking feedback. If there are any elegant systems in use out there or any sort of conversational systems where you can respond to someone's feedback, let them know if and when it's incorporated. Were you, Liz, using like an Excel spreadsheet or Google Sheets or? A Google Sheet. Mm -hmm. Diana, Michael, or Linda, have, have you found the magic solution? Oh, Karen. Unmute Karen, please. I'm unmuted, but okay. Diana was muted. Can we unmute Diana? There we go. Okay. We've had to um, keep track in, in several different ways. One, um, some of the changes, obviously, we can see when we've made them in press books just by who is the last person to edit it. And then I keep track with that date and time in a Google Sheet or something else. Sometimes we use Basecamp um, that says that the changes made um, on this date, on this time, are these changes uh, so that we know. But then there are things that we don't generally uh, track if it's something that's a grammatical error or uh, punctuation, those kinds of things we really haven't been keeping track of. We've been just uh, tracking things that we've been adding or subtracting that are substantial. Hmm. We don't we don't feel that we need to let everyone know that we right. insert the, the comma that they suggested. <laughs> but it does yeah. get unwieldy. It really mm -hmm. does. But it sounds like you use Basecamp for your sort of larger project management. Yeah. yeah, yeah, because each one of my students manages their own projects so so that I can look in and see what everyone's doing. Um, we'll use Basecamp. Mm -hmm. And Michael, does Diana's model, if I, if I heard correctly, Diana, you kind of have two projects um, two mirror projects, one in which is currently in use in a classroom mm -hmm. and one in which you might be making some changes to. Is that right? Yeah. So and, my, we, and we let the author know when they want us to, to copy that back over mm -hmm. um, for, you know, for, for really for the beta testing part of it. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. Michael, you have one copy, right? And you might make changes as they roll in. Right, so the goal here is to have one kind of OR copy, and then one, once that's been done, then to allow professors at other campuses then make a clone of it, mm -hmm. and then it is theirs to adapt and to add and subtract as they will. But the idea, I think the only thing we're gonna ask from um, people who want to uh, just download and use the text and edit is just that if they have any great additions or extra exercises or things like this, they could send those to us and if they look really fabulous 
then what we can do is add it to like the meta or text. So this way, um, in the future, as the years go by, as people are cloning this, there's a lot more information that might be uh, in this uh, initial textbook that you can um, use or not use as you're going forward. So that's what we want out of this book is to just to have um, a good clean copy with your basic exercises and your basic um, passages to translate, the basic approaches in there, and um, then allow this to sort of be the seed from which um, uh, other textbooks can grow, other editions, right? Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? It does. So um, Richard does have what I think is a clarifying question for you, Michael, and that is that you're editing the text in Pressbooks. Yes. And um, just, he's also curious if you uploaded from Word or something else. Did you write it in Pressbooks to start with, or was it born in another form? No, I did it in a much more tortured way. So <laughs> it's actually in um, keynote presentation, all right? And so what happened, this is actually interesting. So if you're, if you're writing everything in these keynote presentations, then the students can download PDFs of this and read it. But you can imagine that the way that you present this, not just in fonts, but even in headings, right? So, so what you're doing on each slide is you're giving a certain heading so that they know where they are at all times. And when you copy all of that over into Pressbooks, your, your language needs to change, the flow needs to change, the kinds of um, uh, visual cues need to change. And so what's happened is we already had sort of the, um, the basic text down. And then as you're sort of getting rid of all the extra headings and creating new charts, because the charts wouldn't copy over, um, it gives you an opportunity to sort of rethink um, your textbook layout. And then the other thing about having things on slides is that you don't always need the definite article. I mean, you're speaking in slide speak, right? <laughs> so then it goes into, and then you're like, I should really use a definite article there because that's actually not a sentence anymore. But you don't need full sentences sometimes on slides, right? So that was, um, it's not a challenge so much is as you're editing that, that then um, uh, makes you a little bit more disciplined to even think about what you were writing to begin with. Mm. And I still miss those definite articles and sometimes those half sentences. That's been one of the things that will be pointed out to me sometimes. The other danger, of course, is there's a lot of copy and pasting of charts and things. And you might forget that the verb luo, which means to loosen or to free, you copied and pasted from dichotomy, which means to show, and you changed all the Greek, but you forgot to change the English, right? Because you copy, paste, copy, paste. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's actually been pretty interesting thinking about uh, the ways in which uh, we express ourselves on slides, the different, the different media that you use sort of change the way that uh, you even speak. Mm -hmm. So uh, everything's dumped into press books. So the editing in some ways is kind of light, but there's still a lot of thinking about how you want to format and do I make this a heading too? Whereas in the slides, what I was doing is um, different headings would be a different size of the font. For example, it wouldn't be, you know, a bold, for example. And another question um, from Robin is about whether this textbook, your textbook, Michael, will be in the open textbook library. And that is a great question. I'll have to take a look at it and see um, how it works with our criteria or talk with Michael more about that. Right, right. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that. I was just going to like give it for free, right? Well, yeah, we do too. We do too. <laughs> right? So... Um, so Aperva has been managing the chat and I just want to check in and see if there are any questions there that we may be overlooking or meanwhile, if anyone out there wants to unmute and ask their question directly, I invite you to do that. I think there were a couple earlier uh, on Linda's project. Um, so Diana, Diana asked, sorry, uh, when we were talking about the feedback from an in-person class versus an online class, whether that was a different kind of feedback that came back uh, from the different students. Linda, did you find that, that there was a difference between them? Um, no, actually, I don't think so. They offered very similar feedback. Um, you know, the the live students would certainly come up and talk to me after class or even during class and point things out. Um, the eCampus students were emailing me, but other than that, the actual comments that were being made were very similar. Mm -hmm. Great. And the other question here uh, was what 
type of feedback was solicited? So you mentioned post assessments at the end of class, but was that uh, assessment integrated in any other way in terms of formative or pre and post assessment? Uh, and that, that question, I think both for you and for the others, uh, for our other guests on how the, the uh, feedback is solicited specifically. Yeah, for me, the type of feedback, I was open in the beginning to anything. I think I still am. <laughs> you know, um, certainly it's nice to get it cleaned up and get spelling errors and grammar issues, you know, so it just looks more professional. But certainly if there were areas that were poorly written or they felt that additional information would help in the explanation of a topic, you know, I was open and there were parts that I completely rewrote. You know, because I got feedback from students that it made perfect sense to me when I wrote it and then figured out, oh, never mind, that doesn't actually make sense. Um, so there were parts that I just completely rewrote, particularly after that first time of using it. And I am actually putting in our guide for beta testers, which was created by Rebus, um, which I believe Zoe and Aperva helped to draft and we had some prompt questions for um, the faculty and students and they they did tend to follow those in some of the narratives. Um, we also found that, you know, we, the biggest thing that I would say emerged from the calls was actually things to add, things that that somehow had been omitted. And one of the biggest things in ours was like failure stories. We had like a lot of success stories, but there were just not enough failure stories in every chapter. So that's something that ended up being added to everything. Um, another thing that I think was interesting is just, yeah, I'll, I'll just leave it there. But I think it was more about adding things. And, and the other thing that I noticed was sometimes we would get the same note um, from different people and even students and faculty would say the same thing basically but in different verbiage and that to us was a real symbol okay that's a note that we absolutely need to implement because clearly this isn't working for people in the section so I have a, a question for all of our guests because I've heard each of you describe a slightly different positioning of the process so Michael I believe you said that um, you may consider students co-editors of the book. Linda, you said, you know, in your summer class, hey everyone, this is the first time I've used this, tell me what you think. And Liz, it sounded like you and your collaborators had a fairly formal system where you framed it as, we want you to beta test this project. So I'm interested in, in all of your thoughts on like the pros and cons of this different framing, if you would consider framing it differently in the future, and how potentially that, um, that framing or process may lead to um, better awareness of your of your textbook or as, as Liz has talked about the marketing of your textbook yeah I mean I hadn't thought about a more formal way but I would like Liz was talking about but I actually like that idea I think if I were to do it again I would probably solicit a little more formal feedback I don't think the formalization is so much of an issue, but I would have liked to make sure that everybody in the class had that opportunity and invitation for feedback. You know, I think handing out something to every student to say, hey, did you want to make any comments about this would make it a more formalized process. And as far as, um, you know, the feedback from all you know, I mean, there certainly would be students that could choose not to participate, but you'd be more likely to get feedback from all the students rather than the ones that feel more invested in the process for some reason. Mm. I, I'd say I actually made, so I was actually looking at another mistake that I made in the textbook that nobody caught until class today. And I was looking at the Greek and then as we were talking about it, I said, okay, that was a nice translation. Now what's wrong with the accents? <laughs> looking at it because they tend to think you know if the professor wrote it in that way it must be correct but we've learned how these things are supposed to be and I'd copied and pasted wrong and hadn't uh, adjusted the accents and so uh, I made it part of the assignment but one of the things that I try to do in class is really um, invite them um, to feel comfortable as they're making comments on the textbook and tell them you know, it's, it's actually pretty normal, right? There are going to be some mistakes and sort of disarm them uh, 
from feeling like they shouldn't be speaking up. And I think that's really sort of allowed um, a lot of students to feel pretty comfortable doing that. And my experiences have been very similar to um, Linda's actually. I mean, I really wanted something that was simplified. Um, I don't teach online here, but I do have one former law librarian who's been reading the book on his own. And so he'll be sending me comments. And his comments are actually um, in line with what other students would be saying. So in general, um, any anything about like confusing sentences or um, grammar mistakes or things like this, um, it usually ends up being about the same kind of comment. And I guess what I want to do is make, um, one of the things I wanted to do with Greek with this textbook is just to make it so that Greek's not so scary, right? Like farmers spoke this, it's just a language. We don't need to light candles and you know, <laughs> you know it's not a cult language. And so one of the things um, that's part of that sort of disarming of, um, of the language is allowing them to feel really comfortable um, talking about how things are being um, expressed. And I guess at this point, I haven't felt a need for um, uh, formalizing what I'd like the input to be like. However, I think that that stage would come in once this goes out to other faculty because I haven't thought about that. Um, it's good to think about um, if I have lots of other faculty from, because I think we're going, our hope is to have another 12 campuses next year. And we haven't actually thought about how we would um, integrate um, all those comments, what kind of form we'd like to comments in, or what kinds of things that we would like from them if um, in theory, uh, they're gonna be discussing approaches instead of grammatical mistakes. I think you touched on something interesting there, Michael, uh, just in your previous comment about uh, this not being how things are usually done and that student expectation of, well, the professor yeah. wrote this, it must be right. And I wonder what the reaction was initially when you proposed, when any of you who've worked with students proposed this to them uh, as a, a very different way of doing things. Uh, it certainly doesn't happen a lot with, with traditional textbooks. I wonder what the initial reaction was to the idea of, of being involved in the creation. I already had them off, off balance because um, the entire course is taught with iPads. So the first day they show up, you, they're handed an iPad because we have a library and we have 70 iPads, I think. So we have got more than enough to check out for the year. Their dictionary is a $5 app. Their grammar is a $5 app. There's um, map apps things like this. And then they were to use the iPads as a way to access the textbook as well as to access all the other materials that they would need. And so just immediately they realized this is a different kind of course uh, in general. And so uh, it was pretty easy actually to then say, oh, and by the way, uh, there might be some like problems with the textbook. So I look forward to hearing from you. <laughs> right. And I think in my case, the students seemed very excited to begin with. Um, and part of that excitement might have been just they didn't have to buy a very expensive textbook for the class. Yeah. But they seemed very excited about being engaged in the process and, and having some, you know, control, having some feedback um, that, that seemed to very much interest them and, and engage them in the class. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for what for one of the faculty who used this um, method in a lower division class, um, the the students were first a little bit hesitant about it. And this was um, this was when they were given um, PDFs of the chapters to read and comment on because um, as I think it was a 200 level course and they were so hesitant because they thought, okay, now I'm going to be critiquing my instructor. Um, what kind of a, you know, what kind of an impact is that going to have on my grade if I'm critiquing my instructor? That's something more that grad students um, are a little bit more used to. Um, but after they got back, um, got through the first um, barrier that they're not actually um, critiquing their instructor, they're critiquing the subject matter, um, a lot of comments came in. But that was a huge barrier um, for the faculty member to overcome and reassure the students that their feedback was not, um, was not going to be taken personally. It is humbling 
by the way, when um, students do notice uh, grammar mistakes and things like this. If anything, the problem I feel is like when I'm standing in front of class and I'm looking at the text and they're looking at it and I just say to myself, oh Lord, <laughs> how could I have left that in, right? Because you see, you see things that you don't see when you're reviewing it exactly. privately exactly. for some reason, right? Exactly. So, so anyway. with that in mind, I have a question here in the chat from Richard. Would you ever think of introducing errors just to make it part of the class so that students hunt them down and correct them? Sort of gamify the whole process. Uh, well, my text already does it. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that many. I mean, it was the example I used today, right? Where I noticed that the accents were wrong and no student had, and the students actually, I don't think it noticed. And so then I just stood there and I said, so now correct the accents. And they might have actually thought I did it on purpose. It was later mm -hmm. that I said, obviously, this couldn't have been um, correct. Um, and I do have some exercises. I haven't incorporated it into the book, but I do have exercises where the accents are wrong and you have to fix them. But it is sort of, it's an interesting idea to put it into um, uh, a textbook. That's actually an interesting idea. There's one mistake somewhere in this chapter. <laughs> It could be in English, it could be in Greek. <laughs> <laughs> so I have another question from our, um, from our description of today's conversation, and that is, how do you decide which suggestions should be implemented and when, especially if you have co-authors, or especially if the suggestions go beyond sort of typos and proofreading, if it's really something more substantive? Do you guys have a process for that, or is it a conversation? What does that look like? I, I can jump in on, on that. Um, we had a lot of different conversations about that. One of the things that came up most frequently was the modularity of the textbook, which was a plus, a, a pro and a con. Um, we built it that way very much as a choice because we know that there are at least three full types of class using use, that needed this textbook, but also other classes that need just a module from this textbook where entrepreneurial journalism is a footnote, essentially, and they may only pull one thing. They might pull you know, one chapter for a media management class, one chapter for a news writing class or something that fits into the curriculum, then they can feel like they got a little bit of it in, but they don't have the full, the full class. And so we did get a lot of comments that, um, and we built it so you can do that. And we got a couple comments that concepts were repeated sometimes that might've been in different chapters. And we did basically respond and say, totally agree that if you're doing the start to finish that that's, you know, not as good as it could be, but we anticipate a broad majority of people using, you know, half of it or pieces of it. And then they would be lacking a very critical piece of information as context for the chapter they're in. So we, we can't do that, but you are welcome to adapt the book. And it would be much easier to take all of those double references out than it would be to, you know, to make it work for both audiences on the, on what I, I'm calling the mothership and Michael has, is calling the er, the er, er but. <laughs> Diana, do you have any comments on this particular question? Uh, so far, all of my projects um, have really been single author or uh, author with uh, students, with their own students. Mm -hmm. um, so they've actually um, managed which, which kind of feedback they were going to take from their students. But I do have uh, several projects coming up that have multiple faculty authors um, and so that is going to be something I'll need to pay attention to, especially um, since a lot of them are not at the same universities. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be dealing with um, a couple of projects that are multiple faculty from multiple universities. So we'll be getting different sorts of feedback. Um, uh, it might even be textbooks that are used in different level courses. Um, but it is the same textbook that they'll be working on. So all of this information is really helpful for me too in these projects that are coming up starting uh, winter term. We'll have to stay tuned. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Linda? Yeah, I would say I had it easy because it was just me. Um, <laughs> there was some decision if a student indicated they thought uh, a particular 
part of it was confusing or needed to be rewritten, you know, if I disagreed or not. I mean, usually you're trying to take whatever they say into consideration, and I might not rewrite it the way, exact way a particular student might want, but I would certainly take into consideration, okay, how else can I write this or what additional information can be added? But at least so far, I didn't have to coordinate with another author, so to speak. I mean, I got the executive decision as far as what changes were made ultimately. You're, you make the executive decision and are the executor to a purpose question in the yes. chat, which is whose responsibility is it to implement these revisions, corrections, and updates? And so if it's, you know, your project and you're the author, it sounds like that was primarily your role. Or wait, am I misremembering? I, I know you also talked about a system between you and Diana and Diana making yes. the changes. Yeah. Yeah. So the, I didn't actually make the changes. <laughs> <laughs> Good clarification. <laughs> And that's, what, that's one of the things that we do. We want the faculty to concentrate on creating their content. So um, we'll do all those changes and all those updates and all of that. And they're, they're teaching courses, they're writing the content. So we'll do all this. Um, we, we have completely handed over a couple of projects to faculty who said, I'm done, this is my final version. Um, and and we haven't made any other changes, but I think they have done some changes. I do tell them that when they do make the changes, I'll need a, uh, I'll need to know so that I can do the PDF exports and the you know and make the other versions. But um, we will make the changes for faculty and update the books for as long as they want us to do. If they never want to do changes on their own in press books, then we'll just do them all the time. That is a service as the as the publishing support and publisher. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like Robin also does the same thing. Michael and Liz, do you guys have someone who takes on that role? You know, I would say that that I took on the role of actually implementing the changes and I probably took the lead role on like first cut at implementing those that I knew we should implement and I knew how to implement them or that I could send back to an author to send me what to implement. Um, and then there were some where we, we had to have a conversation about them and then we would make a decision. Um, and even as you mentioned, we had something like 20 authors and we would bring the author on the biweekly calls with about 12 other people using parts of the book. And sometimes the 12 people with feedback on, on that chapter would disagree. So we could have a long sprawling conversation about whether or not to change something. And if you have 12 minds in the room, so ultimately my collaborator, Michelle and I would have those conversations. Okay, how do we, obviously there's an issue here, but how and to what extent do we address it? And then, then I would be making the changes in the press book. Well, I think we've covered everything in the in the chat, but correct me if I'm wrong. And so since we only have a few minutes remaining, I just want to check in and see if there are any topics or questions that we haven't covered that anyone would like to pose at this time. Erin, this is Richard. I've got a question for our participants. Great. Um, what, this is me being a theoretical communicator. <laughs> what do we do, the, the model for a book, when you look at it, it has covers, it has a front and a back, it has a copy editor, it has a title page. It has authority. It it's, has something that carries authority and trust with it. So what happens is we look down the road, um, Michael decides that he'd rather run off to Aruba and hand over teaching to something else. Do we hand off the book or does it just expire? Do we trust that somebody's going to carry it forward without maintaining it? Or do we think, no, this really is valuable enough to maintain and hand it off to somebody else? Well, um, I can answer. I've never been to Aruba, so that sounds well. <laughs> the way uh, the authority thing's interesting. So um, this Greek book will be peer reviewed 
And so we already have some people who are going to be lined up that will give us like the honest opinions and, and um, adjustments that they think that uh, need to be made in order for this to be um, a book with authority. And then the idea is once you get that, um, as Liz says, Mothership or the OR textbook up there, that is the book that has the authority. What happens, however, which is interesting, is if other campuses then start taking the book and making their own adjustments, um, that is a sort of interesting thing uh, where the authority comes from. But at that moment, I think the authority is basically coming from the, um, the teacher, the professor herself or himself as they're teaching this. Um, and also language instruction might be kind of different because um, the success of that book is, did you learn the language or not? <laughs> so uh, I don't know how those other campuses um, would handle something like that. But we've thought about um, uh, the authority issue. And one of the things we did want to make sure is that we actually, uh, that we got peer reviewed um, on what's actually in the book and what's um, going on with the approach. We've given several talks at conferences about um, in our field about the approaches of the book and about what the book looks like and we've gotten um, some feedback in that way as well and for that for our part we we really came to this from a different perspective so when i um when i came to this i was thinking about we need a textbook but my collaborator was thinking we need a community of practice and the textbook is just one mechanism to build that. And I feel that at this point, there are more than 80 people involved in some aspect of this book, whether they were a peer reviewer or beta tester or a call participant, um, an author. And I think that, I know that we will continue to update the book, but I think there's a community around it that will also continue to say, it needs this, I can contribute this, please use this. And our hope is for next iterations to bring together some of the teaching resources as well, add those into the book that people will want to contribute to the book or expand it or adapt it. And I don't think it's a dynamic thing. A book is not necessarily set and calcified in print anymore. It's not a thing that never changes. And that's what we've hoped to build is a dynamic living book. So the way I think about it is by nature of having an open license, these things become possible, but possible doesn't mean that they'll actually happen. And that's, that is the work as, as Liz says, that needs to be put in, in a, as a community around a book. So this touches on questions of, uh, you know, the challenge of finding out who's using the book. What are they doing with it? Do they use the original version? Do they use others? Um, and are they, are they interested in, in expanding and, and uh, updating the central text? So we have every possibility uh, to, to keep these books alive. How we actually execute that, how we actually put that into practice, uh, I think is what we need to spend time working out. Um, and I think uh, what our guests here today are doing in working with other people and getting these students invested in it as well, that becomes another part of that authority, right? And again, that's that's a, a different kind of opportunity we have. Uh, but it, it, it revolves around the people invested in a text identifying them, connecting them, keeping them involved, and giving them really easy ways to keep this up, to keep this work going, right? Uh, so it, in my mind, that touches on all sorts of parts of the process, and that's exactly what we're working on. And it comes down to people having that avenue into a book. Now, that's a, that's a every one of the comments is, is a good sound one. Um, and I don't know if anybody else has lived lived through a rift in an intellectual community. Um, but it will happen at some point, and it, it, it makes me wonder, as somebody who thinks about this stuff way too early in the morning, um, what will happen to watch a book diverge between communities or between interest groups? Um, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, it's, it's very simple. There are, some, there are some classic texts, you know, Frankenstein, that will really not change. It has an identity. But we've created something without, we're creating things now without a, without a face. And I think that, the, that the, the broader community is really going to have to decide what it is we're actually building. And I don't know, I don't know if the word book is appropriate anymore. Right. Because if it's a system or if it's, you know, then it becomes organic. It changes on its own or it changes in use. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's a one-way improvement street. Sometimes it can 
can go backwards. Mm -hmm. and it certainly will in some respects for, for mm -hmm. some users. And so as, as Zoe was highlighting, there are so many sort of intersecting issues with the Open Textbook Project. And one of the things that comes to mind, Richard, in thinking about your scenario is the possibility of community or scholarly societies that perhaps are the community around a particular book so that if you do have a divergence, um, you will know with, with whom that particular work is aligned or what have you. But I would also like to suggest, since our time together is winding down, that perhaps this is a topic we explore in a future office hours. <laughs> Um, again, the link is in the chat if you would like to um, uh, think of any other topics that you um, are wondering about based on today's conversation. We'll think about how we can um, take some of the questions in the chat and possibly spin them off into future topics together because um, it really is your questions that we want driving these conversations. So it looks like um, in these last couple minutes, Anita asked about um, usage adapting and that, that challenge, which I don't know if we've found a solution to yet either, but we're trying different things, which usually involves spreadsheets. Um, <laughs> and Anita, I know you're trying something too, so maybe you'll, you'll be able to report back and see um, how that's working. So maybe that's also a future topic. But um, I want to be mindful of time. We only have a couple minutes left. So I would like to thank Rebus and our guests, Michael, Diana, Linda, and Liz, and everyone for setting aside some time in their busy day to join us and talk about things that we don't have the answers to, but probably will one day.